he was born um, in uh, uh, on the 20th of June 1883 um, and he was born at Hampton Court Palace uh, in a military family. His father, my great grandfather, was William Alexander Ramsey of the 4th Hussars and his uh, regiment was billeted at Hampton Court uh, and that's why my grandfather was um, born there. I would say that a sort of a very short summary of my grandfather uh, would be a picture of probably a very a highly ambitious, highly capable, meticulous, but slightly outspoken young man who later in life um, matures into a far more diplomatic personality without losing any of his determination and detailed focus. He had um, his family had five children. He was the fourth child. There were two boys and two girls. His eldest brother is a guy called Frank who ends up uh, joining the Middlesex Regiment and later becomes a major ge a general, so he does quite well. Um, around the end of 1896, so this is 13 years after my grandfather's birth, uh, his father, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel W.A. Ramsey, and his regiment, they go off to India. And the reason I mention this is because uh, something rather interesting happens out there, which I believe later helps my grandfather's career. Um, they travel off to India and then on to Bangalore. Um, and I think there is a, uh, there you go, that's the fourth Hussars. And my grandfather, it's not a great picture, I'm afraid. Uh, my, my grandfather is the man in the middle. He's on the middle row. So there's three gentlemen to his right and three gentlemen to his left. He's the one in the middle sitting down. Uh, and in the following year, in 1897, my great grandfather gave a certain lieutenant called Winston Spencer Churchill the acting role of adjutant. Uh, and by all accounts, my uh, great grandfather, so Bertram's father, was not a wealthy man. He'd already got one of his sons into Sandhurst, but his second, sand, uh, second son was Gerald. And the cost of a cadetship to, uh, the, uh, to Sandhurst is about £500 in those days. And we know that Winston Churchill somehow manages to get his son in free of charge. And we know this because in 1899, Winston Churchill writes to his mother and he says, Colonel Ramsey's son has been given the cadetship I asked Mr. G. Wyndham for. Well, Mr. G. Wyndham was the parliamentary undersecretary of state for war and also a cousin of the Duke of Windsor, therefore a cousin of Winston Churchill. So he gets a cadetship, a 500 pound cadetship for my great grandfather free of charge for his second son. So although his parents went off to India in 1896, uh, Bertie stayed in England. Uh, so from the ages of 12 to the ages of 17, so for six years, he never saw his parents. Um, and in 1898, um, Bertram goes off to Britannia, which is uh, you know, a fairly soulless, brutal place. And in those days, obviously, it wasn't the uh, academy, the building that it is today. It was an old ship called the Britannia, which was moored to the river there. Uh, and in his intake, there were 61 successful candidates. My grandfather passed in number 47, so not a particularly great number. Um, and quite interestingly, the future commander of the Dunkirk evacuation and the future Allied Naval Commander-in-Chief of D-Day nearly didn't make it into the Navy at all because he failed his first medical test. And the reason he failed it is because he somehow strained his heart riding and it, the doctors very smartly picked up on this and said they didn't think they'd be able to let him in however for some reason i don't know what the reason was the test was rerun and either the doctor didn't notice or the second doctor didn't notice or didn't care and he passed him so he got in and that's what how he gets into the royal navy there are very few records about my grandfather all we know is he's cadet number 389 and he's we also know that he's actually lacks in confidence. He's very unconfident as a young boy. Uh, he writes to his mother. I haven't seen the letter, but there's a, a gentleman called um, Dr. Andrew Gordon who's writing a biography on my grandfather at the moment. And he's written about this letter. And my grandfather writes to his mother, who's in India, and he says, to get it out of your head that I'm going to pass out a mid, mid being a midshipman. Um, so he's convinced he's going to fail the exam. However, he doesn't, and he passes out 46th out of 61. So the, he passes out at the same 
um, state at the same number that he passed in. And so on the 15th of May, 1899, he reports on board the cruiser Crescent, and that's his first position in the Navy uh, as, a, as a midshipman. And we don't know a hell of a lot about him. Um, there isn't much written about him, although he, his younger sister uh, called Elsie, she wrote later after his death that he was, as a boy, he was a very quiet boy, she said. She said he was very determined. He was always engrossed in anything he was doing. He loved riding, he loved shooting, and he, he loved every single types of, type of game. Um, so he, in later life, he played golf, he played um, uh, polo and all sorts of other sports. He was very good at shooting and, and um, country sports. Um, so we don't know very much about him as a little boy. Um, I've got his pass marks for Dartmouth. Um, if he studied there, you'd study French. Um, there would be general study, French, seamanship and conduct. And for French, he gets, uh, there's three terms. In the first term, he got satisfactory. Second term, he gets fair. Third term, he gets satisfactory. For French, he gets fair, sat, fair. For seamanship, he gets VG, VG, sat. So very good, very good in the first two terms and satisfactory seamanship in the third one. But for conduct, he gets VG, VG, VG. So he's obviously a well-behaved chap. But other than that, we know nothing about him, really, as a young boy. Um, as I say, he's made a, a midshipman in 1899. He quickly becomes a sub-lieutenant in 1902. So he's rising quite nicely. And by 1904, he's a lieutenant. We do know about him. He had very high standards, and he expected the same of others. And he was very angry if other people let the side down. And in 1909, he is the flag lieutenant on HMS Albemarle, which is the flagship of um, a, a gentleman called Rear Admiral Sir Colin Keppel. And a ship comes alongside, and the ship that comes alongside is the Queen. Now, the Queen is captained by David Beattie, who later becomes Lord Beattie. Um, and my grandfather notices something about this ship, the Queen, and he makes an extraordinary decision. He decides to signal the, the Queen, and the signal is eight words, and it reads, Queen's signalmen are a disgrace to the fleet. Now, why he thinks he can do that, I, I don't know. Obviously, David Beatty, the captain of the ship, gets pretty upset. He takes a launch straight over to the Albemarle and demands to see the, the, uh, the Admiral. Of course, the Admiral knows absolutely nothing about this, but says, Apology, I will obviously look into it and deal with it. Uh, this story was told about 50 years later by um, Lord Chatfield, who was first sea lord at the same time. And what he wrote of my grandfather was that he was a very bright young lieutenant of great ability and huge keenness. He was, however, at that age, lacking in tact, which I think is probably quite a soft way of describing what he, he did. He continues to rise up through that clearly doesn't seem to get in his way. By 1912, he's Lieutenant Commander. Um, and in 1915, um, he is given his first boat, which is a monitor in, in the channel, in the English Channel, so the Straits and, and, and the Straits of Dover. And it's a very small boat. This is his, his first ship. It's um, about 54 metres long, about nine, nine and a half metres wide, so not particularly big. And he uh, is in the Dover Patrol for a large part of the First World War. And I think that's very key because that is uh, a part of, of you know, the Dover Straits is obviously, um, uh, and his experience of the Dover Straits become very significant later on in 1940. Um, in 1916, he's, he's promoted to Lieutenant. And um, Chalmers, who was a, um, a biographer who wrote a book on him in 1959 wrote that my grandfather was a disciplinarian his ships were clean tidy punishments were harsh but fair so that's a little bit about his how he ran his ships uh, in 1917 he becomes captain of the brook um, which is spelt broke but for some reason pronounced brook and unfortunately, he has two minor collisions. One during action, he crashes into a block ship uh, uh, over on the other side of the uh, Dover Strait. I can't quite remember where that was. And then in the port of Dover itself, he actually collides with a hospital ship. 
And his CIC, who is Admiral Keyes, isn't pleased. Um, however, I think it's basically let go. But shortly after this, um, he is in command of several destroyers, one of which is the Mawson. And the Mawson sights a submarine, signals my grandfather. My grandfather tells them to go after it. My grandfather follows at high speed, and there are also four or five French destroyers with them, also under the command of my grandfather, and he signals them to chase. All these destroyers chase on this um, submarine. They all drop depth charges, and they think that they've probably done some damage to the submarine because they see oil on the surface. However, uh, fortunately, the submarine wasn't damaged um, because it turned out to be a British submarine. <laughs> So um, there was obviously a court of inquiry, um, but the court of inquiry attributed no blame to my grandfather at all. However, his commander in chief, Admiral Keyes, took a completely different um, attitude and asked him to come in for an interview. And he hauled him over the coals. He was extremely cross with my grandfather. But my grandfather, instead of just possibly saying, look, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but Nobody told us that there were, any, uh, you know, that there were British submarines operating in the area. He actually blames the Admiralty's staff for not telling him or telling his group that there were um, British admirals, uh, British uh, submarines in the area. So he's effectively insulting the and the admiral. The admiral's very cross with him, and the um, his my, my grandfather's first biographer said that um, there was a coolness between my grandfather and Keyes for many years after that. So he's sort of gone through and he's managed to sort of upset two rather senior people uh, in a fairly short space of time. So I think this is where he's showing his, his maybe his lack of tact. Anyway, the, the First World War ends. And in 1919, uh, Lord Jellico selects my grandfather to be his flag commander on HMS New Zealand um, in 1929, February 1929, he marries my grandmother, who's the lady on the left. Uh, she comes from a family called the Mingus, who uh, a family, fairly wealthy family, who live in the borders of Scotland. Uh, they have two children, David, my father, in 1933, and Charles, uh, my uncle, in 1936. Both of them have recently passed away. All I can say about this marriage, the marriage to Helen Mingus is a very successful one. Throughout the war, throughout his life, he spends time and uh, day, every day he seems to, or not every day, but every few days he writes a, a, a letter to my to my grandmother and they're full of love and longing to be home and how much he's missing her and the children. Um, it seems, from everything that you read, it seems to be a very strong and good marriage. Up until sort of about 1935, my my grandfather's career has been fantastic. He's served afloat for 29 years. Uh, for 13 of those, he's commanded nearly every type of warship, including a destroyer, three cruisers, and a battleship. Uh, he studied war at the War College and then at the Imperial Defence College. He's also had practical experience of staff work at sea under four different admirals, including, of course, Lord Jellicoe. 1935 is a sort of a turning point for him. He, he he is offered a place by an old friend of his. Uh, his old friend is a chap called Sir Roger Backhouse, who's just been nominated Commander-in-Chief Home Fleet. And he offers my grandfather uh, a position of Chief of Staff. My grandfather thinks about it now uh, and eventually decides to accept the position in August 1935. Um and my grandfather starts working for Backhouse, but very quickly realises that Backhouse is the opposite of what my grandfather thinks the Navy should be about. He, my, my grandfather is a, is a, is a modern uh, commander, and he believes in finding really good left, uh, lieutenants and, and, and subordinates and then delegating to them. Because in war, you can't do it all yourself. You have to delegate and you have to delegate to people that you trust. But Backhouse seems to be the opposite of that. Backhouse back, back is a centralizer. He wants everything to pass on his desk. He wants to see everything. And so Backhouse wears himself out. And I think at least one occasion after between uh, August uh, 35 and December 35, Backhouse does wear himself out completely, ends up having to be uh, go home and rest for a couple of weeks. And my grandfather brings up this sort of impossible situation with him and says, look, we've got to surely we've got to delegate can i please ask you to delegate more to me so i can take some of the load off you 
And I think combined, we can do a better job. And Backhouse agrees, but never actually does that. And by the 1st of December, 1935, so literally just three or four months after he's taken up this position, my grandfather writes to Backhouse and asks if he can be released. And fortunately, Backhouse agrees that the, the, the combination isn't working and he releases my father, uh, my grandfather, um, after what was described as a very nice chat. My grandfather goes back to Scotland, but very quickly hears there's lots of rumours in the Navy, particularly at the Admiralty, about the bad behaviour of my grandfather. And I think the accusation is that my grandfather is supposed to have behaved badly to um, uh, Roger Backhouse. Well, there's obviously there's no way in which I, I could know if that was true or not. There's no proof of that. Um, but my grandfather was very, very upset uh, about hearing this news and he raced back to London. He took the train down to London and he goes to see Admiral of the Fleet, who at that stage is a guy called Lord Chatfield. Oh, no, he's not. He's Admiral Chatfield. Oh, he's First Sea Lord Chatfield. That's correct. And he speaks to Chatfield. And in the 1959 biography, uh, by all accounts, Chatfield um, accepts my grandfather's story. And a few days later, Chatfield's naval secretary wrote to my grandfather to say that Roger Backhouse gave you a nice and kind report, extremely fair in every way. His obvious intention was not to prevent you being considered for another job. My grandfather goes back to Bowtrick, which I'll try and um, come down to. There's the house that he lived in with my grandmother. This is the house I was telling you in the borders. And he spends a happy year there. And in 1937, he is offered a position of senior naval advisor on the Yangtze, which he's just not going to accept he's now got a couple of children and he declines it uh, so he's eventually replaced on the retired list on the 10th of october 1938 um so that is almost exactly 40 years to the date of when he started in the navy and it must have been quite a painful end to his naval career uh shortly after that backhouse becomes first sea lord himself and he nominates my grandfather uh to be flag officer of Dover, which is very fortuitous. And I guess he does that because he knows my grandfather's had a lot of experience at the Strait of Dover in the First World War. Uh, but he nominates my grandfather to be um, uh, in charge of the flag officer in charge of Dover if war should break out. And obviously in 1938, we're just around the corner from the Munich crisis. So it is a possibility. And as we all know, the Munich crisis happens. My grandfather goes to, to, to Dover. Um, the Prime Minister Chamberlain comes away with a piece of paper and we've got peace in our time. And so everybody goes home again. My grandfather leaves Dover and goes back to his house in Scotland, Bowtrick. But on the 12th of January 1939, he's actually then made a vice admiral, but he's on the retired list. In August 39, about 10 days before the um, outbreak of the Second World War, he is posted back to Dover to set up uh, the offices and the command. Um, there wasn't much there when he got there. Um, my grandfather seems to, I think through his connections, he knows uh, he knows um, Alan Brooke very well, uh, who later becomes General Alan Brooke and later Commander-in-Chief General Staff. He knows exactly what's going on in France. He probably knows more than the public knows or more than the press are informing. And he's clearly very, very worried about the situation. Long before the um, the evacuation, the order for the evacuation comes, he is already preparing for the worst. And he's signaled to the Navy um, ahead of time, and he's asked uh, the Navy, uh, sorry, the Admiralty, to collect and organise as many pleasure boats, steamers, coasting vessels, so these are the ones with flat bottom ships, and rowing boats for close shore work because he knows that at some stage we're probably going to be taking soldiers off the beaches. And although he's got huge battleship, you know, de de destroyers and God knows what, these big ships can't get into the coast. So the idea of the small ships was and always has been to take the guys off the beach, bury them out to the slightly deeper water, unload them, then go back, pick up more guys. And, and it's a shuttle service. And uh, so he's well ahead. He's planning um um, for the uh, evacuation. He's writing loads of letters to my grandmother at this time um, about how worried he is. Um, he gets visited by Churchill, and that's Churchill in the dynamo room at uh, Dover, pouring over some document. As we know, um, that, you know, Dunkirk was basically a panic. It was a scramble. 
Um, the order to commence Operation Dynamo, uh, the evacuation of Di Dunkirk, was received by my grandfather at seven o'clock on Sunday, the 26th of May. There was no time to get any men off that night. And the government had told the Admiralty, or the Admiralty had told the government, I believe, that they the maximum amount of troops that they thought they would be able to save would be about 45,000 troops. However, as, as we all know today, um, Operation Dynamo um, was far more successful than they could ever have hoped. On the first full day of uh, Dunkirk, my grandfather sends a very um, capable chap called Captain W.G. Tennant over the channel. He sends him over to France with 12 other officers and 150 men. And the purpose of this is that Tennant is going to, Tennant and his men and his officers are going to act as the eyes and ears of my grandfather. So they're going to go over onto the beaches, they're going to spread out, they're going to stay in, in, in contact, in constant communication, and they're going to tell my grandfather, tell the Dover base where the troops are, where my grandfather and his command need to send the ships, what type of ships would be best, where not to send the ships, you know, if there's problems, and to keep constantly in touch so they can maximise the few days that they've got to get as many troops off as possible, and it works. It's tremendous. Um, another general is obviously Alan Brooke, who's a very old friend of his, later Commander-in-Chief General Staff. He uh, is rescued and arrives at Dunkirk together with many of um, and all of his um, second corps. And the first thing that um, Alan Brooke does on arriving at, uh, at Dunkirk, uh, at, at uh, um, um, Dover, is to go straight up to the offices of my grandfather, which are actually in tunnels in, in Dover. They're, they're, they're all open today. You can go and see them. It's a museum. He goes straight up to see my grandfather, to give him the information, his perspective of what's going on in France, and, and that it's probably the, the, the evacuation is probably going to have to last at least another two or three days. After six days, on Sunday, the 2nd of June, Tennant, who's the gentleman, you know, the officer, the captain he sent over to uh, uh, the shores in France, signals my grandfather it's a well-known signal and the signal reads b-e-f e evacuated um so nearly the job seems done they thought that was going to be the last night actually it wasn't they had to go again my grandfather actually signals the admiralty and he says you know the, the men are pretty worn out he said do you really want us to go for one more night and the first seat lord says yes i'm sorry but yes you have to so my grandfather signals to all of his ships that night, and this is on Monday, the 3rd of June, 1940, he signals, we cannot leave our allies in the lurch. And sorry, the reason they're going back for this last night is to save some of the French soldiers. So the, 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 the signal to his ships is, um, we cannot leave our allies in the lurch. And I must call on all officers and men detailed for further evacuation tonight to let the world know that we never let down our ally. And off they went for the last night. The last night, they um, rescued about 26,000 troops. And that, that, that last 26,000 troops made up of 338,000. Um, I, I seem to remember somebody told me, and I think it was at one of the um, one of the uh, my visits to Dover, that they remember that in Dover at that time, at the cinema before a uh, some film or something my father's grandfather's um, image appeared and all the people in the auditorium stood up and clapped so I think he, he, he'd become very very well known he was you know quite reported in the newspapers and I think many people were incredibly grateful that despite the utter humiliation of being surrounded in France that we had somehow managed to save our army and saving 338,000 men I think is quite a feat because I looked up how many men we actually had in the British Navy in at the end of January 1940 and I think the British Army consisted of 1.1 million now whether that included the Air Force as well I don't know but if you save 338,000 of it it's a big chunk of the army so he received that, loads of letters of thanks the first one is one from Churchill which is the one on the right where Churchill congratulates him on his KCB. And in the letter, it's a very difficult for you to read, but it reads, the energy and foresight called for in so formidable an undertaking and the courage required 
to carry it through in the teeth of the loss gave you the full opportunity to display your qualities. Uh, there was another lovely letter from General Viscount Gort, who wrote, we of the BAF can only say thank you. And in doing so, we shall never forget an achievement which will live forever in the annals of the sea. The French Admiralty, uh, Admiral Darlan of the French Admiralty, he wrote and extended a special thanks to Vice Admiral Ramsey. He was knighted um, for his services uh, at Dover in 1940. He was given a KCB, um, although he was left on uh, the retired list. He wasn't made a full admiral. He was left on the retired list. Um, and that's how that ended up. Uh, he stayed at um, Dover for the next couple of years. Um, and it, this was the time that we were expecting an invasion of German from Germany. Not sure how possible that would ever have been. But the British quite rightly made lots of preparations for the defence of southern England. And the general in charge of the defence was none other than General Montgomery. And my grandfather has an awful lot to do with General Montgomery, who he describes as when well, he writes letters to my grandmother. And he says, I've had the most invigorating time with the Iron General. He is without doubt a tiger of a man full of ideas and opinions and fairly stirring everybody up. To get on with Montgomery, I think is quite a, quite a feat because not many people could. Um, Mon Mon Churchill described Montgomery as in defeat, unbeatable, in victory, unbearable. But during the war, time and time again, as they go into uh, into future operations uh, in um, Husky and in uh, Normandy and D-Day later on, he builds up a fantastic rapport with Montgomery and they share a mess together. And so he gets up. And I think this is the maturing of my grandfather, the sort of the tactlessness of his sort of early life seems to have gone. He seems to be far more diplomatic. In 1941, obviously at the end of 41, uh, following 7th of December 1941, the Americans come into the war on the side of the British. And the Americans are obviously very fresh. They've got lots of money. They're very, very keen to do something. Um, and the first thing they want to do is they want to put an, invade, you know, uh, an assault across the channel onto France. And uh, the British, who have been there for quite some time, are very much more cautious uh, and say, well, no, I don't think that's possible. We haven't got the material to do that. Uh, so they start looking at other op other options, uh, options which really the British wish to do, which are, you know, the invasion of North Africa, because that's where the oil is and all sorts of other uh, strategic objectives. Um, and the Americans eventually agree that, OK, the first invasion will be North Africa. But during this time, my grandfather is called by the chief of staffs up to London to start to examine some of the practical implement, uh, implications for the various invasions. And they were all called Roundup. I think the French one was called Roundup. And then he started looking at the, at, the, um, at the invasion of North Africa. And my grandfather genuinely thought that this work was just temporary work. He thought it was, he was merely acting in an advisory position. But to his surprise, on the 28th of May 1942, he was appointed flag officer expeditionary force. So all of a sudden, he's um, being considered for invasions, uh, obviously something that he's never had any experience of before. But then um, again, probably not many other people have either. Um, and the first operation is Operation Torch, where the senior uh, commander is obviously Eisenhower, who's um, um, uh, Allied, a Supreme Allied Naval Commander-in-Chief. And my grandfather very carefully puts together all the plannings, the landings, and it's the landings of, um, it's not a huge landing, it's uh, compared to uh, Husky and D-Day, but it's, it's two landings, it's, the, uh, it's, it's several landings by the uh, Americans and the British on the shores of Algeria and Morocco. Uh, and he spends quite a lot of time with Cunningham, who is the um, commander in chief, um, his superior commander in chief uh, in uh, Washington. And they have to agree all the plans with the with the with the Americans. And this takes a huge amount of diplomacy because everybody's got different ideas. So the plans are constantly getting changed and rechanged. And eventually they, they agree on a final um, brief uh, which my grandfather then goes to explain to all of his naval colleagues and what they're expected to do. 
And there's a Lieutenant Hans Hamilton who wrote, Admiral Ramsey did not take 15 minutes in speaking to us, but in this conversational, concise, happy, quiet way, had conveyed every salient feature of this exciting vision. Um, although my grandfather is uh, is, a sub, uh, is, uh, is a deputy to Admiral Cunningham, it's fairly clear that my grandfather did all the planning. Um, but the Americans wanted Cunningham to lead uh, the command because the Americans knew about Cunningham. Cunningham was a very capable, highly successful, as you probably know, um, admiral who'd won you know, done very well in early in the earlier stages of the war in the Mediterranean. And so, though my grandfather has planned it, Cunningham leads the uh, the assault. So. He gets on very well with his commanders. Um, and then shortly after the successes of Operation Torch, um, where the Axis forces surrender in about May 1943, the Americans and the British are immediately now looking at the invasion of Sicily. And again, the Supreme Commander is, is Eisenhower. <clears throat> and uh, my grandfather is chosen to plan the landings. But this time, not only does he plan the landings, there's two landing. There's a Western uh, task force, which is commanded by the Americans. It's an American uh, admiral called Hewitt. And my grandfather commands the Eastern one, the Eastern task force, which is commanded by, by my grandfather with three rear admirals leading. Um, and so for the first time, not only is he planning uh, uh, an invasion, he's also commanding it in his um, ship. And the ship he ran that day, I think, was the Antwerp, which is a rather old ship. Uh, and this is probably the first very big combined air, sea and landings assault. It's 150,000 troops, 3,000 ships, 4,000 aircraft, 600 tanks, 1,800 guns. It's an enormous undertaking. One of the things that I think my grandfather was very good at was having to understand if you're taking the army across on your ships, you have to understand what they need. So when they hit the beach, what's the first thing they need? What machinery do they need? What's, what things do they need to pass, you know, arrive in a month's time or sorry, a week's time or two weeks time. And he used to spend most of his time with, with the generals trying to understand exactly what they needed so that he could make sure that that's what he delivered. Um, during this time, he's getting, he's seeing an awful lot of Montgomery. They're planning a lot of these, this, this invasion together. My grandfather writes of Monty that Monty is streets ahead of all the other generals in fighting ability. He and I get on famously as I can tell him home truths in a way that none of his profession could attempt. And, you know, occasionally when um, Montgomery is being a bit of a fool, my grandfather can actually say, you know, stop it, uh, behave yourself. And there's, I haven't got enough time to go into a couple of things that happened, but um he was, um, they clearly had a very good working relationship. They both enjoyed each other's company. And during one presentation to a whole load of army and navy, Montgomery explains the, the attack and the plan for the attack and the, uh, the assault on Sicily. And after he's spoken for however long it was, he then passes over to my grandfather and introduces him not as Admiral Ramsey, but as General Ramsey which is rather interesting, uh, but he did it on purpose. And uh, uh, the reason he did it is because he believed that my grandfather could, could fully understand exactly the position that the, uh, that the um, army needed. Husky is a complete success. Um, the Axis, as I told you, they, they leave very quickly. Um, and uh, my grandfather goes back to London, but he's still <clears throat> on the retired list. It's quite extraordinary. He's now uh, op commanded Operation Dynamo in 1940. He's planned uh, Operation Torch uh, in 1942 and now uh, Operation Husky, but he's still on the retired list. So he's not really getting a hell of a lot of recognition from the Admiralty. My grandfather goes back to London. Um, and I think one of the first places he goes, for some reason, there's a party at the Dorchester and Mount Batten, who he's worked with earlier uh, in the war, comes up to my grandfather and whispers in his ear and congratulates him on his future appointment as Naval Allied Naval Commander in Chief of D-Day. My grandfather didn't know. Uh, the people who joined him was obviously Eisenhower again as uh, the Supreme Allied Commander in Chief. 
Montgomery uh, for D-Day was obviously the army commander in chief and Lee Mallory, who's uh, my grandfather's very old friend, uh, is the uh, allied uh, air commander in chief of D-Day. And Lee Mallory um, is great friends with my grandfather. It's just complete coincidence. They'd all studied at the Imperial Defense College in the twenties. And so they know each other very well. They all share messes. They get on brilliantly. Um, and uh, I think it's quite a happy family. Uh, the planning for D-Day is just like the planning for Husky and Torch. The Americans have got certain ideas. The uh, British have got other ideas. And between them all, they really need to sort of put it all together. And um, what is given to my, I suppose, the difference between obviously D-Day and Husky and certainly Operation Torch is the sheer scale of the operation. On the 6th of June, 1944, my grandfather has 6,833 ships under his control. Uh, the only way you can manage that is through delegations. So he's been absolutely right from day one. You know, delegation is absolutely key. I mean, on D-Day, on, on the day of D-Day, the, um, the, the navies under the command of my grandfather delivered 132,000 troops to the shores in day one. By the end of June... So this is the 30th of June, 1944. So about three weeks later, uh, my the Royal Navy had landed, well, no, the Allied navies had landed 850,000 men, 148 vehicles and 570,000 tons of stores. Now you only do that through tremendous delegation and organization and control. And by the end of the Battle of Normandy, those figures had risen to 2 million men 400,000 vehicles and 3 million tons of stores. And bearing in mind that all of this is being landed at Aramanche. And my grandfather throughout the whole of 19, you know, the second part of 1944, after uh, we've we've got a, a shore in France, is trying to make the generals understand that we need a port. Uh, and we need a proper port, uh, not this temporary port. The temporary port's been fantastic, but it's, it's past its sell-by date. Uh, but obviously the Germans know this and the Germans are destroying all the ports as they retreat back through the countries that they're being chased out of. However, um, fortunately, on the um, September that year, we managed to take uh, we managed to take the port of Antwerp and Antwerp was the second biggest port in Europe at the time. Uh, but it takes my grandfather something like two months to convince the army that they need to, we need to start to use Antwerp. And the reason we can't use it is because the Scheldt River, which runs up to uh, Antwerp, is unusable because it's, it's infested with Germans and they're well dug in and well armed. And they're there to stop the Allies using the port. And so eventually the army uh, listened to my grandfather and uh, they... Um, they... Uh, uh, my grandfather puts forward plans for an invasion of the Scheldt estuary. And by November, the Germans are removed from there. And it then takes three weeks of mines, three, I think it's 150 minesweepers to clear the Scheldt of all the um, bombs and mines that the Germans have cleverly planted there before we can start using um, the uh, port of Antwerp. Once we get to the port of Antwerp, then that's fantastic because we can start to uh, take our men further and further in and we can get better supplies them. And there's a slide that was, I should have showed you this earlier. That was the um, planning operation for Husky. So my grandfather on the right in the white is Montgomery on his left. And Gangar is one of the gentlemen on the left. Uh, and there's another one there. That's the planning for D-Day. As my grandfather with um, Eisenhower outside Southwark House, which is where they were based. That was their last headquarters uh, in England before they moved over to France. Before D-Day actually took place, um, my uh, grandfather was invited to 10 Downing Street for a dinner. And other people at the dinner were people like the King, Lee Mallory, General Spatz, uh, Tedder. And by all accounts, they had a very nice dinner. Um, and at the end of the dinner, my grandfather asks my father, to, my grandfather to stay behind. Um, after everybody had left, um, Churchill said to my grandfather that he'd asked the first Sea Lord and 
the first lord to put him back on the active list. Now, this is actually in uh, February uh, 1944. And Churchill had asked them to do that before D-Day took place. Um, and he'd also put my grandfather's name forward to the king. However, what actually turns out, although this conversation happens in February 44, you know, four months before, three or four months before D-Day, uh, my grandfather wasn't actually returned to the active list until 26th of April 1944, which is just 41 days before D-Day. On the following day, on the 27th of April 1944, he was made a full admiral. Uh, and there was a gentleman who worked with him at Dover um, called uh, Captain Hale. So he knew my grandfather very, very well. He'd worked with him at Dover during the Dunkirk evacuation and uh, at this time was working with my grandfather for Neptune, which is the obviously the naval um, part of uh, Operation Overlord D-Day. And the decision to of which day they're actually going to commit the, the troops uh, to D-Day is actually ultimately made by Eisenhower. But before he makes it, he goes around the room, he asks my grandfather, Lee Mallory of the Air Force in Montgomery, what their thoughts are given the current weather forecast. And Vice Admiral Harold Hickling, who's then a member of my grandfather's uh, team, he said, when the decision was balanced on a knife, which it was because the weather still wasn't 100% clear, he said, when the decision was balanced on a knife, Bertie was as calm, as possessed, as urbane, which I had to look up, and apparently that means courteous and confident, he, and as cheerful and amusing as if it had been our daily staff meeting. So my grandfather is described as being totally, totally calm um, about the plan to go on the 6th of June. Um, Montgomery also agrees that the 6th of June is the day Lee Mallory says, yes, he can operate under those weather conditions on the 6th. And then the big decision is obviously left to Eisenhower, who, after some thought, says, yes, we're going. So after the decision is made, Montgomery comes up to my grandfather and he asks my grandfather what he proposed to do. And my grandfather's reply is, is an interesting reply because the operation has begun. It's too late to stop it now. There is wireless silence and we can expect no signals. I am therefore going to bed. And I, th I th that is interesting. It just shows how calm he was. This must be the biggest night of his life. Uh, he's got 7,000 ships out there and got, you know, 150,000 men. And he's able to go to bed. He's that confident that the planning that they've been planning over the last six months is going to work. And he goes to sleep. He also kept a diary in the war, uh, which was published by Hull University in 1994. And um, on the 6th of June, 1944, the first two words on the day are D-Day. And my grandfather wrote in his diary, I was called at 0500 and not before, which meant that nothing bad had happened or I should have been called earlier. He said the sky was clear, thank God. So that night, day and dawn bombing was going well. Surprise seemed to have been achieved up until the time the paratroops had been dropped at 0200. So very interesting how he managed to go to sleep. He generally seems to have been able to sleep and somebody had to come and wake him at five o'clock. Um, on the 31st of December 1944, my grandfather wrote his last letter to my grandmother. So he's writing to my grandmother, so I won't be coming home. I've got a little bit of business just to finish. I want to make sure that the 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 shelter, uh, the uh, port of Antwerp is safe and the Germans who are just simply too close for comfort are pushed away. That Tuesday morning, he gets into his aeroplane, which is a Hudson, which he's been flying around Europe in. And he gets into it at 11 o'clock on the 2nd of January, 1945. And um, sadly, um, eyewitnesses who saw what happened said that the aeroplane seemed to have great difficulty in getting airborne. And at a height of about 300 feet, whilst turning slightly to the left, the aeroplane dived and smashed into the ground, burst into fires, burst into fire, and everybody on board was tragically killed.